All right, this, uh, this morning we are concluding our Bible study going through the book of 1 John. So we've been doing this for the past five weeks, uh, one chapter at a time, going verse by verse. So we're going to finish up the book here. And um, if you like this kind of study, I decided to do a Bible study on Sunday morning because there's some people who come to church only on Sunday mornings. And I wanted you to get a, a feel for what it's like to come on a Wednesday night Bible study. We do this every Wednesday night. Right now we're going through the book of Psalms and we go through various books of the Bible on Wednesday night. And you can get this type of Bible study every week here at Stronghold Baptist Church. So let's dig into this chapter here. Um, there's a lot to get into. I won't be able to cover everything perfectly because there's so much doctrine packed into these chapters, but uh, I'm going to do my best here. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, I just want to illustrate real quickly here that first phrase there, the first half of that verse. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God is it demonstrates the simplicity in the gospel of what, how easy it is to be born again. And in a time where so many people try to make it really convoluted and real confusing and tell you got to do all these different things to be saved. If you want to make sure you're saved, you know, you got to live a good life. You got to go to church. You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. And if you don't do all those things, you're going to hell. And it's like, no, that's false. That's not true at all. All throughout scripture, we have uh, the simplicity of the gospel and Throughout history, people have always tried to frustrate the gospel of Christ and the, and the, the good news of eternal life. But, uh, and today, it's no different. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of false gospels out there, but even this verse right here is illustrating the same thing. I, I, we could go on and on, uh, as we do when we go out soul winning, we show people, you know, like Acts 16, for example, verses 30 and 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Believe in him. It's not whosoever should live a good life and give up all their sins and, and, and dedicate their life to following Christ. It's whosoever believes in him. Just like in two verses later, John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Pretty, pretty, you know, concise statement there. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's, it's, why is he not saved? Why is he condemned? Because he didn't believe. That's why. So over and over again, all throughout the scripture, we see this same thing. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. That's it. That's the gospel. It's, it's simple truth right there. So, continuing here, whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, we always want to be careful reading the words as they're stated and make sure we get the right understanding. So, this is not, this does not say that everyone who is begotten of God loves God. But it says that everyone that loves God also loves their brother. So what this is teaching, what this is, has been teaching, especially in chapter 4 quite a bit. So we're starting in chapter 5, but, but you've got uh, chapter 4 as well. Leading into this chapter, if you want to look at verse number 20 or even just verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Uh, for, who, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. So the clear teaching is that, is that, look, if you say that you love God, then by default, you must also be loving your brother. Amen. And there's, there's similar statements like this throughout 1 John as well. Like, you know, if you, if you say that you love the Father, then you have to love Jesus also. Amen. Right? If you're, if you're going to obey God the Father, well, you have, to, you have to obey the Son. You can't have one without the other. And similarly here, hey, you're going to tell me that you love God. Well, the only way that you can... 
show and prove and actually be considered that you do love God is if you love your brother. Because if you don't love your brother, then you don't love God. But neither one of those things say that um, you're not saved. And so we're looking at the definition. What is, what is the Bible clearly teaching? Now, the Bible says in verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. Here's how we know that we love the children of God. Here's how we know that we love our brother when we love God and keep his commandments. So when you love God, how are you going to love God? By not just some feeling, not by just saying, oh man, I just love God. There's more to love. You know, we, we ought not to just love in word, right? But in deed and in truth is what the Bible says. So the, what, what is it that demonstrates your love? What is it that shows your love? It's your actions. It's what you actually do. It's what you're actually putting in a process. Hey, words, words can be cheap, right? People say a lot of things all the time, but that doesn't mean it's real. And one of the things that we found consistently throughout this book is calling out, hey, people may say this and people say that and people say this, but if it's not followed up by this, this, or this, here's your test, then they're lying. Then it's not true. For example, just, you know, you keep your place here. Look at, look at chapter number one, right? First John chapter one, verse number eight says, look, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So when we go out and we talk to people who are in this holiness movement and this, this sinless perfection crowd and think like, oh yeah, man, I haven't sinned in months or years or we, you know, whatever they say, you're a liar. Amen. You're a liar. I mean, the Bible literally says, hey, look, if someone just says, I have no sin, you're a liar. Hey, the truth isn't in you. I know that you're a liar because the Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And not just that, we've got the flesh that continues to pull us into sin. That no matter how hard you try, you have this war, this daily battle, this daily struggle all the time. And nobody, nobody is consistently walking in the spirit every single day for days and weeks and months and years on end. Just not happening. That happened. You're going to tell me that, I'm going to say you're a liar. Mm -hmm. So the, this, this, this passage, this uh, epistle here of John is calling out a lot of this. Look at chapter 2, verse number 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So people might say, oh yeah, I'm in the light. I'm walking in the light. I'm walking with God. But then you hate your brother. The Bible's calling you out as a liar. Mm -hmm. It's saying, no, you don't. You don't love God. When you hate your brother, you don't love God. Because if you love God, then, you're, then you love your brother also. And, and we see these teachings throughout this passage. Look at chapter 4, what we saw, verse number 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. We get a lot of people that say a lot of different things, but that's why we go to the word of God to see, well, what's the truth? People claim, people even claim the name of Jesus, right? Just like people claim to, to be followers of the Lord, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees would say, oh, no, no, we believe in Moses and we believe, it, we believe God, but we don't believe in Jesus. Well, you didn't believe Moses. Because Jesus even called him out and said, look, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me. For Moses spake of me. So you can't, you can't separate the two. They claim to believe something, but their actions and their words say otherwise. They tell the real story. And that's why we need to know the truth in God's word so we can discern between those who tell the truth and those who lie. Because the Bible will help us to, to get that understanding and show us what we need to uh, believe here. Look at, go back to 1 John chapter 5. How do, I, how do I know that I'm loving the children of God? Well, when you love God and keep his commandments. The Bible says this in verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So, 
We, chapter 4 spent a lot of time on the love of God. And people will like to turn to this passage, and, and I, I, mean, I love turning to this passage. It's a great passage. But when you don't have the right understanding or definition of love, you can walk away with all kinds of, of crazy things. I mean, today you've got the perverts, the sodomites saying, oh no, God is love and love is love. And they want to just conflate perversion with love and just pretend like it's all the same thing. Like, no, abomination is not love. Amen. They're two completely different things. And they want to slap these labels on it and say, see, God's just loving and God is love. So, uh, I mean, even the, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, oh, is a loving God going to make someone burn in hell for eternity? Yeah. Yeah. That's their argument. That just demonstrates how unsaved they are because they, they have no idea who Jehovah is. They think they know his name so well, but they don't even know him. You know, how about for our God is a consuming fire? Amen. God is love. Amen. Amen. God is love. God is merciful and long-suffering. <laughs> Praise God for that. We need that. If he wasn't those things, there'd be, we'd, we'd have no hope. Well, of course he's those things, but he's not a single-faceted God either. God is complex. There's more than one attribute of God. So while God has love, God also has wrath. And, you know, just read your Bible a little bit and you'll be able to figure that out. But it's not enough just to read the Bible. You have to believe the Bible. You have to believe the words that are spoken there to understand and know, like, yeah, this is who God is. He is a loving God, but he's also a God of vengeance and a God of wrath, which is why we need to be saved. Which is why Jesus came into this world to begin with. I mean, if people aren't punished in, in hell, what do we need a Savior for? Yeah. I mean, even yesterday, I was out talking to someone who was, who was saying that, well, I don't really believe that in, in hell. I'm like, well, so do you just think everybody goes to heaven then? And they weren't willing to just say yes, but it's just kind of like, okay, well, if, I mean, if that's the case, you're really downplaying the sacrifice that was made at Calvary. I mean, you're really downplaying what Christ did. Why would God come to this earth and be born of a virgin? Why would, why would God humble himself and go through what he went through and suffer the shame and, and allow for his own creation to whip him and to mock him and to beat him and to hang him up on a cross, to suffer and bleed and die? Why would, why in the world would God go through all of that? Why would that sacrifice have to be made if, well, I mean, there really is just no consequence at all for your sin because no one really goes to hell. There is no judgment. It's ridiculous. It's, it's all just a show then. No, friends, it is, it is true. And God does love us and God is love, which is why he provided that gift of salvation, which is why Christ came to begin with, out of love. We love him because he first loved us. And he first loved us by dying for our sins and making the sacrifice and the atonement for our sins. Now that gives us the opportunity to, to reciprocate love and to love him back and show our gratitude, our thanks for what he did for us by loving God. And what do you do when you love someone? You're going to listen to them. You're going to respect them. And with God specifically, what are you going to do? You're going to obey him. That's how we show our thanks. We show our appreciation. We show our love. We demonstrate that by going, not just by saying, oh, God, I love you, but by saying, God, I love you, and now I'm going to listen intently, and I'm going to see what you would have me to do. And that's why chapter 5 is important as a follow-up to chapter 4, because if we all know, remember, when these epistles were written, they were not separated by chapter and verse. That was done just for ease of being able to preach and reference different parts of the Bible. But this is all one epistle. So as in chapter 4, we're talking about all this love, he kind of finishes up and wraps up all of the talk about this love with 
verse number three in chapter five that says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. It's not just some feeling. No, it's, it's we're going to keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Just for those that think that it's such a, a horrible thing, like, oh, you want to follow the commandments? It's such a horrible thing. I can't believe you'd want to follow God's rules. Oh, I got all these rules. My life is just, there's just no joy. It's just no fun, right? Because God has all these rules for me. No, they're not grievous. They're, if you would actually just, just listen and trust that God does love you and that God does care about you and he really wants you, he, he cares about your well-being, then you would look at those rules as something that God is putting in place for your benefit, which is the truth, which is what they're there for, Amen. as opposed to just to keep you from having fun. You need to grow up a little bit if you think that having fun is found in sin. Because if you have that mindset, you're in for a rude awakening. And I, I'll tell you from experience, unfortunately, as someone who really joyed in sin for, for a, a good part of my life when I was younger and foolish and ignorant, it seems like it's so much fun, and it's not. It brings misery, it brings sorrow, and it brings destruction in your life. And, and I'm not just using hyperbole or speaking like... Uh, um, exaggerating here it really is that bad and that's the the you know hey the wages of sin is death the end of that thing you know um when lust is conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death Amen. so what the bible teaches and it's true the bible teaches that because it's true and god tells us about it so that we don't have to figure that out or find that out for ourselves by experience but that we could just trust the word of god and then not go down that path I love going out soul winning in areas that are a poor demographic or the ghetto as you might call it, right? One, because people generally are much more receptive because they're very humble and they know that they need help in their life. So they're, they're, it's a lot easier for people to turn to Christ when they're humble, right? So we end up seeing a lot more people putting their faith in Christ. But it's also a good opportunity, as I used personally with my own children yesterday, to teach them on the results and what happens with sin. Okay, here's, you know, here's what you're going to hear. I was telling my daughter, I said, there's going to be time in your life when you're going to have people trying to tell you that drinking alcohol is going to be fun. And you've heard me say not to do that, right? And you see the scripture tells us not to do it. But you're going to hear people telling you, this is fun. Oh, look, we'll do this. And you may have an opportunity to do it and no one will ever find out. I'm saying, don't do it. And, and you know why? This lady that we were just talking to, do you see where she's at? And she was opening up. And look, I'm not just trying to denigrate some person I was talking to but she would tell you herself. I mean, she's in this condition. She's like, I don't even want to drink. But I do it anyways. I don't want to do this stuff. I'm, I'm in this and, and just in a miserable condition. And look, not everyone that takes a sip of alcohol is going to turn out like that. That's true. But you know what? Nobody ends up like that who doesn't drink alcohol. <laughs> and that's a fact. All the people who never touch alcohol, all of them, they never become addicted to alcohol. <laughs> They'll never in that condition. Because every person who's in that condition, it starts off small. It's going to start off slow. And you can very easily say, that'll never be me. Ne why? Because I'm never going to touch it. Never going to look at it. I'm going to actually heed what the Bible says about that and not do it, not go down that path and not be deceived by sin. And God's commandments, you know what? They're not grievous. You don't need booze or drugs to have a good time. Whatever, whatever satisfaction, whatever your flesh feels when you do that, it's nothing compared to the joy of being in the Spirit. And again, I'll tell you that from experience 
But the word of God will tell you that, which you should just believe that anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. My experience doesn't trump the word of God. The word of God trumps my experience. Amen. But I'll testify you today that, yeah, this is true. Over and over again, it's true. Uh, keep your place here in 1 John 5. Turn back, if you would, to Matthew 22. So yeah, the love of God, hey, we keep his commandments. Oh, you're so legal. You know, people are, you're so legalistic. I can't believe that you want to you wanna follow the law of God. Like, Don't you know we're free from the law? Yeah, we're free from the curse of the law. Amen. Amen. And that is great news. And thank God for saving us from ourselves, from our own sin, from the, from the punishment of our sin. Thank God for that. <clears throat> Truly, thank God for that. But what do you think then? That the, the, the commandments are there for just no reason then? Just to make you a sinner? No. The commandments aren't just there to make you a sinner. The commandments point out, as a schoolmaster, teach you you're a sinner. But it doesn't stop there because if you love God, then you're going to keep his commandments. It points you to the Savior. Then once you get saved, hey, now I could go, God, I'm going to show you my love for you by, by listening to you and keeping your commandments and being obedient to you. But you say, how does, how does verse 2 and 3 tie together? And you're in Matthew 22 to stay there. We're going to start reading verse number 36 in just a second. So by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So how is it that we, how do we love the children of God by loving God and keeping his commandments? I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. Like it shows, I could see how that shows I love God, but then how do I, how do I love my brother also? Because loving your brother is one of the commandments, <laughs> right? Look at verse number 36 of Matthew 22. The Bible says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law. There's a question asked to Jesus. Okay, there's all these commandments. What's the great commandment, Jesus? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So loving God, right? And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and all the prophets and everything we see in the Old Testament, this is all wrapped up into these two commandments. Because when you love God, you're not going to do anything again. You're not going to use the Lord's name in vain. You're not going to have any idols. You're not going to have any other God before him. You're not going to, you know, all the things. You're going you're gonna to honor and respect the Lord. Anything that you might sin against God, hey, if you love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, Every commandment that we see that you would be in transgression of against God, you won't do those things if you just love God completely. And similarly, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to commit adultery with their wives. You're not going to uh, covet their good. You know, you're not going to do any of the things that would cause harm to your neighbor. So all the commandments about that, love them like yourself. You wouldn't want anyone doing those things to you. So if you truly love them, you won't do them. You won't transgress against them. And if you truly love them, you'll also, not just the sins of commission, but you'll do, the, you'd, you'd be in a, a, a not guilty of the sins of omission where you don't do things, right? The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So it's not just not doing bad things, but doing good things. Well, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to do good things too. Right? So if you have this perfect love, you're going to not only not do bad things against God, but you're going to do good things for God. If you love your neighbor yourself, you're not going to not only do no evil to them, but you're going to also do good to them. Does that make sense? Yep. And of course, the Bible spells all of that out in much more detail, but if you just got those two things down, I mean, that's, that's perfection right there. Total love for God and total love for your brother. And that's why he says then, well, hey, if you love God, then you're going to love your brother. And if you're not even loving your brother, you can see how can you even say that you love God? 
go back to 1 John chapter 5. Verse number 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And then clarifies, And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And I'm just going to cover this real briefly because there's more stuff that I want to get into. But people will, and if you want to, you can look at Revelation. Cha Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are uh, these chapters that talk about the different churches. There's letters written to seven different churches at that time in Asia. Okay, And some people will want to use these passages in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where it uses the word overcoming to teach a works-based salvation. See, it's not enough to believe you got to do the work, you got to do this, you got to do that, and we'll tell you you got to do all these things, and they'll point to these verses. But what's interesting about that, and this is why there's so much, like the, 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 the human aspect, the human authors of these the epistles, where God has, has given the wisdom and used these men to, to write down his word, you know, I, I believe he's, he's given... Um, different knowledge to different men, right? And, and as a collective, as a whole, we've got all the word of God. But this is also why you see some similarities in the teaching. So like the things that, that John knew and that God had opened up and revealed unto him and, and was revealed through his word is consistent through the book of John, through the epistles of John, and through Revelation because John was that instrument that was used. And that's why you see a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities between the teachings that are taught in those epistles. And this word overcome is only used in Revelation and in 1 John. Right? So people will turn to that and say, like, no, look, you've got to overcome. Because we tend to use that word like you're overcoming obstacles by doing this and doing that and putting in a lot of hard work. Right? So they'll look at that and say, well, I guess I have to do a lot of work then to make sure that as Revelation 2, 7 says, it says, He hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, I guess I got to do a lot of work then to make sure that I could eat of the tree of life. And that's what they'll teach. And they'll say, well, look, I mean, even in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Well, you got to overcome, man. You got to overcome that sin in your life. You got to over, And they'll start inserting things that aren't there. Does it say you have to overcome sin? No, but, but that's how, the false preachers will slip that in there. Yeah. And they'll tell you that. That's not what it says. Just like, just like they'll tell you, oh yeah, repent means to turn from your sins. Uh, no, it doesn't. The word repent does not mean turn from your sins. The only way repent could mean to turn from your sins if it says to repent of your sins. But just repent all by itself has nothing to do with sin at all. Because if you think it has anything to do with sin by itself, then you've got a big problem with God being a sinner. The Bible tells us that God repents in the Old Testament a lot. Okay? What he did? He changed his mind. But anyways, I'm not going to get into the whole uh, repentance thing right now. But it's another one of those teachings that people want to slip in a workspace salvation telling you, no, 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 you got to give up your sins in order to be saved. Uh, no, you don't. Well, have you? Who here has given up all their sins? I mean, you, you, hey, maybe you've said it in word. But, but who doesn't sin? Oh, yeah, let's go back to First John chapter 1. We could, we, we could just call you a liar right away. So if you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved, I'm sorry for you. Because now you're going to have to be without sin, which nobody is. You're damned already. And then, yeah, I have, I have a bunch, and, and I'm not going to continue going through these just for sake of time. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you can see this overcome, 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 overcome. But in 1 John 5, we get the definition of, of what it means to overcome. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What is it that allows us to overcome? Our faith. Not our works, our faith. That's the victory. The victory is in Jesus. Amen. It's in Christ. 
and that victory is because of the faith that we put into him. Uh, verse number five, who is he, back in 1 John chapter five, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. So again, overcoming uh, the victory is our faith, and who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth. He that believeth. He that saved. Why, how is it, I mean, how could you ever overcome the world? You can't by yourself. That's why you have to put faith in Christ. Christ overcame the world. Christ conquered death and hell. Christ conquered all of it. Christ conquered Satan, okay? which is why you have to put your faith in Christ to give you that victory over the world because otherwise we're doomed to go down with the world. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, again, I can teach for a long time on this subject or this concept, this doctrine of the Trinity. So I'm going to cover it briefly for sake of time because there's so many things I want to get into in this chapter. It definitely deserves an entire sermon, but we're going to look at some other passages that support this doctrine. And, you know, people say, oh, I don't like the word Trinity. It's not found in the Bible. Okay, but the concept is there. Amen. Right? I, who cares what label you put on it? If people understand that label, then what's wrong with that? Amen. And I think people understand the word Trinity. I don't think that's a word that's under confusion today. You got the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, or the Father, the Word, and uh, the Holy Ghost. As we see here in 1 John chapter 5, 7, this is the, I would say, the best and just absolutely most clear verse in the whole Bible, just stating that God is three in one, a triune God, three parts, one God, okay? Which, by the way, this verse is also just missing from all the modern translations of the Bible as well, which is why we are King James only preaching church here. The, 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 the King James Bible is the word of God in the English language. And that's what we speak here and that's what we preach here. So that's what we use here. Um, and, and this is, of all the verses that are all screwed up and stuff, this is one of the most deceptive in the new versions too, the modern translations. Because what they do is they combine verses six and seven and try to make it just sound like there's only one thing being stated here. And you, that's your homework. You could look that up later. I've got some, some false versions of the Bible. I've got some right up here in my pulpit. You could come up here after church and, and check them out for yourself. I've done this in the past. You could look it up and see what they say for yourself, how they combine the two. It's very deceptive. But there, there are two different things being stated in verse 6 and verse 7, or verse 7 and verse 8, actually, um, verse 7 and verse 8 are the ones that they combine. And they're different. They're not the same. There are two different thoughts being expressed here, but they'll combine them into one. So you can, you can check that out later. I'm not going to get into the whole uh, translation thing at the moment. So let's look at some other witness from Scripture about there being three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Uh, you can flip back to John chapter 1 if you'd like. Of course, one of the most famous passages. And if, when you're ever explaining this concept of the Trinity to people, because it is important because it is who God is, I like to explain this to people, especially people of other faiths that are non-Christian. Just explain who God is and why it's important. Why do why, so you Pastor Burson, isn't that kind of a secondary doctrine? Not really, because in order to understand the gospel and what Jesus did for you, it's kind of important to understand who Jesus even is. Because while Jesus was a man, he's not just any man. It's not like, oh, this great man, this great prophet, like the Muslims will tell you, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus is great, but so is Muhammad and so is Moses and so is Abraham and all these other people. It's like, no, no, Jesus is not the same as those guys. And definitely not the same as Muhammad, but <laughs> he's not the same as Moses, as Abraham. You know, 
because they're all sinners. And Jesus was not. And Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That is so important. I mean, that's the only way that, that our sins could even be paid for. It's not like I could live this great life and be like, okay, crucify me, and I'm going to pay for the sins of everyone in the whole world. They can't do that. No man can do that. But Christ was able to do that because he was sinless, because he's gotten to play. I mean, just think about that. God in the flesh, exalting the love of God that much more for his own creation, for what he made. I mean, we can think about things that we make, and we can't make anything as complicated as, as life or as a human being, right? There's obviously a higher value of that. But, I mean, what are you willing to do for something that you just made and that you can destroy and you can just make another anytime you want? I mean, you get that? Like, God can literally cast down, destroy, create life anytime he wants to. But he chose to love us. And that's where, you know, that true love comes in of saying, like, you don't have to do any of this for us. You can just wipe everybody out and just start new and, and have some other creation. Do whatever you want. But he loved us. And he loved us enough to... to, to to send the Son, the Word, God incarnate in the flesh, to know exactly what it's like to be the creation. To know what it's like to be in this flesh. To, to know all about it through experience. And to, to offer up that sacrifice that could only be made through the blood of Christ. And I mean, that's a loving God. And as we're reading about you know, the love of God, that is the love of God. He first loved us. That's why we get to love him. And who Jesus is matters. Because it's not just some man. It's, it's, it's God incarnate. So in John chapter 1, and if, you, if you're not familiar with these, make note of them. You know, write them down so you, could, you can show people uh, the truth of, this, of, of who God is. 1 John 5, 7, of course, is where we were just reading in 1 John. But John chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So this concept of here, it's only mentioning two, but there's two separate, two distinct, but the two are one. Which is exactly what 1 John 5 is, is stating, except the Holy Spirit is included in that, there's three that are one. You've got three, and they're absolutely distinct. Father, Word, Holy Ghost, three totally separate persons. And again, I, I mean, this requires a lot more time to get into all the scriptural evidence and support for calling them persons, their own will, their own, you know, like all, but, but it's all in union and there's still just one God. And in John 1, 1, hey, the beginning was the word, the word was with God. So you've like, like brother Michael, come on up here. He's like, Stand up here. I could say, like, hey, I'm with, I'm with Brother Michael. But there's no way of illustrating, but I am Brother Michael, right? <laughs> like, we're not, we're not the same entity, the same creature, right? The same being. Go ahead and have a seat. So, like, that, that's how we think of being with someone. So, Jesus is with the Father. He's with God, but he also is God. And, and... That goes a little bit beyond it, and it's kind of hard to, to understand how all of this plays out. Um, in John chapter 1, before I get there, we're going to also turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So, in verse number 14 then, the Bible says, because you're thinking about what the Word, well, 1 John 5 is talking about the Word. John chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2, talking about the Word. But then in verse 14, it's real clear that it's talking about Jesus when it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Evidently, the, the, whoever is the only begotten of the Father is talking about Jesus. Right? And that's when the Word was made flesh. So the Word, therefore, is Jesus Christ, undoubtedly. There's no way you, could, you can make that be anyone else. Uh, but turn, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Because the Bible even tells us here in verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery. 
How this could even be is, is, is a mystery to us. How can it be that God can become a man? It, it, it's, it's hard to fully wrap your mind around, and I don't think we could ever fully comprehend and understand exactly how that worked. I don't think we can ever get to the point where we could boil it down to the microscopic level of like DNA and, and everything else. I, I don't think we could ever fully understand that because it's a mystery. And the Bible tells us this great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But see, God tells us this is the truth. And this is where you have to just accept this by faith. We may not understand all the ins and outs and how this could even be possible and how can God put any type of limitation on himself as Jesus Christ clearly had because it says he grew uh, in, in wisdom and in stature. As he was a younger child, he grew in wisdom, but God's all-knowing. Yet he took this limitation on himself when he became a man and dwelt among us, right? So there's, there's, there's certain things and certain attributes here that somehow, simultaneously, Jesus himself could even still be God and still have the limitations of a man at the same time. It's kind of a paradox for us. It's kind of hard to, to get our minds around. But even Jesus himself, he says, the, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So no man hath ascended up to heaven, right? But the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And he said this while he was on earth. It's in John chapter 3. He's speaking and just saying like, hey, no one's ascended up to heaven but the Son of Man, which is in heaven. But the Son of Man was there on earth. But he possessed the attribute. He, he is God. He didn't just possess the attributes. I mean, he is God. So, you know, it, it, it is a mystery to us. But we still take the word of God on faith. The, the word of God is clear enough for us to know, like, <laughs> Jesus, without doubt, is God. Without doubt, there are three that are one. Without doubt. I mean, there's no question about that. It is clear. That is clear enough for us. Trying to make your brain hurt by really digging into the details and trying to figure out how could this really physically happen? So, I, I don't know, right? We're, gonna, we're just going to call that a mystery. And the Bible's going to tell us. And, and, you know, this is where I believe we can just stop. When God just saying, hey, you know what? Great is the mystery of godliness. That's good enough for me. I do want to understand as much as I can, and I think everyone ought to. I think we should strive to get knowledge and wisdom and understand these things, but we still have to be able to accept our own limitations to understand the deeper things and some of these greater mysteries and just be willing to say, okay, I'm just going to accept this by faith because the Word of God says it, even if I never fully comprehend it, because some things will go beyond our understanding. And when you, and, and this is where a lot of people get into trouble, is when you really try to dig in and understand more things than you might really be able to. This is where I think the Calvinists come into a lot of problems. When they start trying to uh, um, teach about like the predestination and see like, well, God, God already chose certain people to be saved and certain people to be damned. And they say, well, since God knows everything, and then when God makes this person, he already knew, even before he created them, that they wouldn't be, you know, and, and they start going down this path of thinking and, and trying to logic and reason it through, but then they end up through their own faulty logic, which it has to be faulty logic, contradicting clear passages in Scripture. Because the Bible clearly says that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And he died for everyone especially those that believe, Amen. right? That specifically makes a, a, a mention to say, hey, he died for everyone, but then specifically like, hey, and those that believe. So it's, like, it's everyone's the whole group, and then there's those that believe. And it's two different groups, but he did die for everybody. So, so you know, when, when you start trying to understand and get into that mindset of God, we can't fully know <laughs> We have the mind of Christ in the Bible, but as human beings, we can't get all of that or even feign to think that we could ever comprehend some of these things that even the Bible says, hey, this is a great mystery. Fine, we'll leave it at that. 
Without controversy, greatest mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. That's Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 1, another great passage. Again, just proving the deity of Christ. I'm not, you know, I'm, I struggle with being limited on time because it's such an important doctrine that is clearly taught here in 1 John chapter 5. But uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Unto the Son he saith, Amen. Thy throne, O God. And who is saying this? The Father. The Father is calling the Son God. Amen. I mean, if, what, what, <laughs> what more testimony do you need than the testimony of the Father calling the Son God? But then, just to illustrate still more of the separation and difference between the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, after he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. And that's showing an authority structure within Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Three persons, one God. Just like when Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done when he was in the garden. Clearly, unequivocally, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. To the point where Father even calls the Son God. Yet, there's wills present. Yet, there is authority structure present. So, again, um, and, and one of my favorite verses, and, and go back to 1 John 5 if you would, is, is at the end of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is that great sermon by uh, the martyr Stephen, who he's, he was preaching against his Pharisees, and they end up killing him. They end up stoning him, right? They, just, they get enraged. They stop their ears. They just don't want to hear it anymore. They can't handle the truth. And they uh, pursue Stephen and kill him. And it says in verse 59, or at the end of that chapter, it says, and they stone Stephen, calling upon God. So what's he doing? He's calling on God. And what did he say? And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The narrator of the Bible is telling us that Stephen called up to God. And how did he call up to God? Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. Jesus is God. There's three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Verse number eight. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, Verse 8 here is definitely tied back to verse number 6. So we have the witnesses in heaven, Father, Word, Holy Ghost. Witness in earth, spirit, water, blood. Okay. Now just a couple of things to think about here. Jesus was the witness on earth. Right? Amen. And Jesus spake through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit, when he was on this earth. Okay? In his fleshly body. Verse 6 says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. So there's your water and blood. Then, of course, you have the Spirit with that. So the, the witness on earth is the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ incarnate. Right? Water and blood. Um, but it makes a point in verse 6 to say, hey, not by water only, but by water and blood. You say, why, why that distinction? It's not there for no reason. It has to be there for a reason. There, there wouldn't be a, a clarification of that if there wasn't a good reason for that. And, and here's what I believe about this, okay? One, it's the, the humanity of Christ that God didn't just become incarnate in, for example, a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body, right? And then when we die in this, from this natural body, we have flesh and blood, right? This body is going to pass away, but then we're going to get a spiritual body that's different from our natural body. 
Jesus Christ didn't come in his spiritual body until after the resurrection. And there's some interesting things that we kind of can take notice of with the spiritual body because he was able to end up going into places where all the doors were closed. There's some different physical attributes about that spiritual body. And again, I'm not going to say I understand all of that, but we can see that. We can, we can see when we read it going like, well, wait, how, how can he just all of a sudden kind of appear? But he's in this body and he tells them, hey, handle me. And he says this, he says for a, a spirit, because they thought they saw a spirit. In Luke 24, 39, the Bible says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. He didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bones. And, you know, again, this is, this is another deeper subject, but the Bible teaches us that the blood is the life of the body. But we won't I don't think we're going to need that blood being the life of the body in our new body because Jesus is the life. Jesus is going to provide everything for us in his kingdom when we have a new glorified body we won't need the blood. Jesus shed his blood for us and he's the one that gives the life. So we'll still have bodies, but the blood won't be necessary. And we don't need to bring our blood into heaven. Jesus brought his blood into heaven for us. So, but the fact that it's pointing out here, hey, he came by water and blood. He, he did become a man. Like he, he became human flesh for us. Born of a virgin, but, but he was a human. He was a man and God at the same time. But not just appearing in a body. And, and you say, well, who would ever believe that? Jehovah's Witnesses. There's other cults that believe the same thing. Yeah. Maybe he's Michael the Archangel. It's weird, right? Like they just try to say someone else, and even the resurrection, they'll say like, oh yeah, he came, but he came in a different body. No, he came in a regenerated body. He came in a, in, a, in a spiritual body, but it was still his body that was changed. Let's see. So, uh, man, I'm running out of time already. You could also, you could also, I believe, you know, th there's there's depths of of. Um, of knowledge and understanding in what scripture teaches and kind of pictures and illustrates to us. I think we could also see with the three that bear witness in earth. Of course, again, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the birth of Christ, which would be like his born of water. Like where John chapter three talk about being born again. You have to be born of water and of the spirit. So you've got the water, but then you've got the blood, which could represent his death. Or is shedding of blood for us. So you've got the spirit, the birth, and the death of Christ being witness to, uh, of God in earth. So um, I think that's just, it's just another level of, sy of symbolism that we can, we can see from this based on, on uh, other clear scriptures. Let's keep reading now. Verse number nine, the Bible says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is extremely important here. To the, to the same theme in 1 John, calling people out as liars, right? Hey, you say you're without sin, you're a liar, deceiving yourself. You say you love God, but you hate your brother, you're deceiving yourself, you're a liar. It's not true. You don't love God. And then here, if you say that you are saved or you say that you have eternal life, but you don't believe the record that God gave of his son, you're a liar. You don't, you don't really have eternal life. You're not saved. And here's the record. I love that this, this passage and, and, you know, we'll look at this next verse and then I love to use this verse out soul winning to explain why we talk about some of the things that we talk about because while salvation is very easy, you have to believe the right things about the record that God gave of his son 
in order to be saved. And it's just one verse, but there's actually three points in this one verse. So the Bible says here in verse number um, 11, and this is the record. So if you don't believe the record, you're making God a liar. Verse number 11, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. So what are the three things we can see there? Well, one, that God hath given to us. Given implies a gift. It's given. It's not earned. It's not rewarded for your merits. It is given to us. It's free. It's a gift. He's given to us what? Eternal life. Not temporary life. Not conditional life. You know, it's, 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 it's eternal life. Right? It's not based on how long you can stay good and, and follow the commandments of God. It's forever. It's eternal. And then the last point, and this life is in his son. It is only through Jesus. Amen. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. There's no other way to be saved other than, so if you're saying there's, there's oh yeah, Jesus is cool, but there's also, you know, Muhammad and Gandhi and, and whatever, like any other person. You're like, no, absolutely not. You're making God a liar. You're not believing the record that God gave of his son because he's the only way. That eternal life, you can't achieve eternal life any other way. It's only through Jesus. It's only received as a gift and it is eternal. And the, the most problems we have is people believing that it's eternal. And that's why I like to show them this part. Look, if you don't believe it's eternal life, if you think that it, that it could be forfeited and lost, that is not eternal. That is not forever and you're not believing it's given, and you're, you're not believing it's eternal, then you're making God a liar. And the record that God gave of his son, who you need to believe on, you're making him a liar. Because that's the record that was given. Verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So there's two things. Like, look, I've written these things unto you, Unto you that believe, look, that you may, one, know that you have eternal life. You, you can know. You don't guess. You don't think. You don't just say, well, maybe. I mean, I, I'm trying. No. You know you have eternal life. Why? Because we believe the record that God gave of a son because we know that it's given. We know it's not through my works. I know it's not through anything that I do. It's through what he already did for me. I have eternal life. God doesn't lie. He gave the record. So I'm not going to make him a liar. If he says, hey, it's eternal, then I'm going to believe him. It's eternal. If I tell you something's forever, you could, you, could, you could doubt me. But if God tells you something's forever, he don't lie. It is eternal. And I mean, what better confidence can we have than God just making a promise and saying, hey, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Even before the world began, he made that promise. Eternal life. It's a gift. Through Jesus Christ, believe that you're saved. It's eternal it's forever. I believe you, God. I don't think you're lying. Which is the only reason I can have so much confidence today to say, and I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I know for sure, 100%, no doubt. Zero doubt in my mind. But you don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to do next week. You don't know what you might do with your life. You're right, I don't know. But I know that I've already been saved. And I know that God promises eternal life. That means forever. Like John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You have it. That moment when you believe, I have it. I have everlasting life. I'm not going to get it later when my body passes away. I already have it. Amen. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It's done deal. Already happened. Amen. Amen. Great confidence here. And this is why, you know, a lot of people tell you, well, you know, no one could know that but God. Well, God does know that, but he told us how you could know that too. Right. Which is why we have verse 13 written here in 1 John chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. See, you can know it. You don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. I do know I have eternal life. Verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, I'm not going to go into this. I just went into this last week when I, when I preached on prayer and getting your prayers answered. Look, if you ask anything 
according to his will. He's going to hear you. We got we to gotta ask the right things. We can't be asking for things to consume it on our lusts and on our flesh. God's not going to be listening to that. Just as much as your parent isn't going to be listening to the kid that just wants something stupid, right? Just wants to blow money on something that really doesn't do anything for them, whatever. Um, no, you, you ask me something good, something right, then, then I'm going to hear you. And that's what he's saying here. Now look at this in verse 15. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And, and that's great because it also gives us confidence that God is a good God. God is a loving God. And when we're asking for the right things and we, and we got our heart right and we want to serve God and we want to obey his will and we want to be in the will of God and we ask him for stuff, he's going to hear us. And then he's going to grant us the things that we, that we want. God, God will answer the prayer of us finding a great location in Greenville to start a church plant there. I have no doubt about that. Well, I know it's God's will. Do you think, you, or wait, is it not God's will that a bunch of people get saved through the efforts of, of people trying to teach the, the word of God over there in Greenville? Is there any reason for us to think that, 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 you know, this is some area that God has blocked off for us? I don't, I don't think so. A work being done, a church being started, a group of believers gathering together to, in, in unity to, to preach the gospel to every creature and, and to grow and to be discipled and to, and to baptize converts. Yeah, I kind of think that that's what we were told to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it sounds like the will of God to me. So it sounds to me like, hey, if we ask, then he's going to hear us. Amen. So no doubt, full confidence. And we can have that confidence. I have that confidence. Verse number 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. I'm going to have to just preach another sermon on this, I think, another day. But I'll just leave you with this. Praying for good for, for just everybody, for no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, just everything, just, just everything always good and just always pray for God to bless people all the time is false. Okay, it's a false doctrine. Now, we need to look at other scripture. We need to kind of compare this to get a really good, thorough understanding of, of what the Bible's talking here because the Bible says to love your enemy. There's a lot of areas where the Bible tells us, obviously, that we need to, to bless those that curse you. Right? So it's too complicated to get into right now, unfortunately. I wish I had more time, but I don't. So uh, I, will, I will in the future go more in depth on this. Uh, in the near future, I'll cover this a lot more in depth. But just so you know, like um, you know, a precursor here, the, the, that God sent a prophet to rebuke King Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament when he yoked up with the wicked King Ahab of Israel Right, the northern kingdom of Israel, <laughs> by the way, there's a, there, there's a whole subject in itself. I thought we we're supposed to bless them that bless thee, right? This is Israel. He militarily joined up with them and yoked up with them and said, yeah, we're brothers. We'll fight in the same battle with you. Jehoshaphat was a godly man. Ahab was a wicked king. And the nation of Israel was wicked, as they are today, by the way. But Jehoshaphat went and joined up with him. I mean, I thought that's what we're supposed to do. I thought we're supposed to bless them. And he got the word of the man of God coming, delivering the word of God and saying, hey, shouldest thou bless them that hate the Lord? And, and therefore, now you're going to be punished, Jehoshaphat. Therefore, wrath is upon thee. So, again, there's a lot more to that to dig into. But just know that you can't just always wish good on people all the time. Otherwise, this wouldn't make any sense. Because there is a sin unto death, and I do not say that you shall pray for it. So there is some things you don't pray for. All unrighteousness is sin. True, no doubt. And there is a sin not unto death. So there's sins unto death and there's sins not unto death and you're saying not to pray 
for the sin unto death. Okay, but again, there's a lot more to unpack there. We'll do that another day. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 18, so we can close up here. Verse number 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Go back to, to the sermon on chapter 3. Because he covered this, this concept was covered already in chapter 3 more thoroughly. And I preached on that in chapter 3. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. And thank God that he's, he's given us understanding. And God's given us the gift of allowing the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to guide us into all truth and wisdom. Okay, so we're not left without a guide. We're not completely left to fend for ourselves. We have a God-given understanding and discernment, and God has imparted to us some level of understanding to be able to, to determine what's true and what's not true. And throughout even this chapter and elsewhere in Scripture, it teaches that, you know, like, like for example, they went out from us because they were not of us, okay? And, and Jesus said, you know, my sheep hear my voice. Another shepherd they're not going to follow. So we, we have some inherent understanding on a lot of the basic things that we should be able to, to, to hear the truth in the Word of God and recognize it as such. And this is a similar understanding that we have um, and, and I know I, I've heard the same testimony by so many different people. When you're out soul winning, you're preaching the gospel to people, and then you run across someone that's saved. There's a there's a connection there, and there's an understanding. Hey, you know what? There's some people I feel really comfortable with that they're children of God, because there's a kinship that's it's hard to put into words. It's experienced Amen. with other people who are saved that you just know, like, yeah, you know what? Obviously, they're giving the right answers. Right? They're, they're, they're expressing, they're testifying with their mouth the, the salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But there's definitely people who are just like, man, the, you know, they're, they're a brother or sister in Christ. And that's an understanding that I don't like really teaching on that too much because it's, it's, it's not as easy to nail down and be very explicit with, with, the, with spelling it out for us. But it's one of those things like if you know, you know. If you're saved, you know. The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay? You can't really explain that to someone who's not saved because they don't have the Spirit. So if you have the Spirit, you know for yourself, hey, I've got the Holy Spirit and I've got my Spirit, and the Spirit is going gonna, is gonna to witness and testify that, that I am a child of God. So I know for myself that I'm a child of God. And I can't use that to prove to you that I'm a child of God but it definitely provides comfort for me, right? So there's understanding there that God has given us to understand spiritual things because a natural man receiveth not the things of God but because they're spiritually discerned. And he's given us an understanding and, and, and he's helped give us a guide to be able to discern between what's true and what's not true. And of course, we have teachings from Scripture um, identifying false prophets and things like that. And then the last verse here, little children, keep yourselves from idols, Great passage. Obviously, we want to not have any idolatry, anything that would come between us and God, anything that we would put our affection on above God. Hey, God's love. Let's love God. Let's keep his commandments. He closes off. Hey, keep yourself from idols. Don't allow anything to, 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 to be in the place of God or have affections that are only prescribed for the Lord. Keep yourselves from idols. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Thank you so much for this great book of the Bible. So much, so much doctrinal uh, teachings here in this epistle, John. I pray that you please continue to open up our understanding, Lord. I pray that you open up my understanding as I continue to read this passage over and over and over again throughout the years, however long you give me on this, on this life, that you'd help me to understand more and more out of these passages and um, help us all to grow in knowledge and in wisdom, Lord. And, and especially, Lord, help us to reach the lost. Help us as we go out this afternoon. And, and faithfully serve you, dear Lord, that you would bless us, you would, you'd guide us, you'd, you'd help us to, 
to find the right words to explain the simplicity that's in Christ and the gospel so that people could understand it, so that people can, can realize that, that if they haven't been believing right, that they can see the difference, they could change their mind, they could put their faith on Christ as their Savior today. Lord, help us in that endeavor. Help our church to grow and to reach that many more people. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen.